Welcome, guys, to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, the most will you can, and on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of news stations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of independence. We go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to actually get the in order to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do here how the friend we got here. Thanks for listening and uh, hold on. It's gonna be fun. All right, guys. Today's date, August the 10th, 2022, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, the most will be counting how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. Uh, before we get started, guys, let you know that, yes, even though we are a news program, we still try to watch our language and at the same time, uh, but words can be said sometimes. And also, there may be things that might be shown that might be too intense for younger viewers. So viewer discretion is advised, aside from that, welcome. So how do we begin? Well, there's really not a way to begin with this. One would say this was coming. One would say that the chicken's coming home to roost. But in any case, we can say this, and we never thought we'd be able to say this before the 2024 elections are coming up for president, uh, for the president of the United States. mar lago got its FBI moment. <laughs> Overnight, supporters gathering outside former President Donald Trump's private club, Mar-a-Lago. Trump in New York, departing Trump Tower and ignoring questions from reporters. Mr. Trump, can we get your reaction to the raid, sir? In a statement issued just before 7 o'clock Monday night, Mr. Trump said Mar-a-Lago was under siege, raided, and occupied by a large group of FBI agents claiming it was unannounced and portraying himself as the victim of political persecution, adding, they even broke into my safe. According to a source familiar with the search, it was related to classified information the former president allegedly took with him to Mar-a-Lago after leaving the White House. In February, the National Archives announced that classified material was discovered in 15 boxes of White House records stored at the estate, referring the matter to the Justice Department. Eric Trump says he told his father about the search. To have 30 FBI agents, actually more than that, descend on Mar-a-Lago, give absolutely you know, no notice, go through the gates, start ransacking an office, ransacking a closet, you know, they broke into a safe. He didn't even have anything in the safe. Republicans overnight criticizing the search. Senator Lindsey Graham writing, launching such an investigation of a former president this close to an election is beyond problematic. The Justice Department is also pursuing a separate investigation into January 6th. Last month, Attorney General Merrick Garland telling Lester Holt that an election would not affect their efforts. So if Donald Trump were to become a candidate for president again, that would not change your schedule or, or how you move forward or don't move forward? Uh, I'll say again that uh, we will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. Of course, as a candidate in 2016, Mr. Trump repeatedly blasted candidate Hillary Clinton for mishandling information in emails. During the raid here yesterday, there was a representative for Mr. Trump, a lawyer who says that she has been cooperating with the FBI and the Department of Justice. The head of the RNC saying what happened here was, quote, outrageous and an abuse of power. The White House says that it was not notified of what was happening here. And when NBC reached out to the White House, they referred all calls to the Department of Justice. Savannah? I can't. Okay, so aside from the guy in the background who decided the fake news is CNN. So let's, let's go ahead and knock some few things out. Donald Trump is not a, uh, I gotta put this ever so nicely. I, I can't take this away. D.L. Hughley said it best. Donald Trump is not a Black Panther. He is a black sheep that has gotten away with it for many decades. Could this be that everything that he has done is finally coming back to haunt him? Could his comeuppance be around the corner before the 2024 presidential elections? Maybe. But let's take some things. Let's take some. The whole thing, they really, again, and I hate to say this to you guys, 
This is the second time. Actually, I don't really hate to say this. I'm actually trying to prove a point. This is the second time that a legal procedure was done properly. And Donald Trump, unfortunately, <laughs> so he unfortunately got gets to be a part of it. The first one was the election. The first one was the 2016 election. The 2016 election in which we know who didn't win. Okay. That also being said, that he was the same person, which keep in mind, the same person that touted his election before Hillary, the same person that touted his election before Biden. Oh, they're gonna they're gonna try to scam me. They're gonna try to do this. They're gonna try to they're gonna try to screw the votes. They're gonna try to mess with the electors. This is the same guy who cried wolf when in his election with Biden. His election with Biden was one of the fairest and safest presidential elections out there. Safest. There was zero fraudulent votes, despite what some of the GOP and Trump were saying, because they're still telling the big lie to this day. That by far was the safest and most protected election in modern history. And yet Trump is mad because he lost. This particular search FBI, and again, in FBI, it's like, why are we surprised? You know, it's like for a lot of people that don't know the number of people this had to go through. First and foremost, you had to get a judge or a magistrate to sign off on this. You had to get the Attorney General Merrick Garland to sign off on this. The FBI Director uh, Christopher Ray, Christopher Ray, uh, Ray, who Trump appointed was in on this. The Secret Service had to coordinate with the FBI. The Governor Ron Governor Ron DeSantis, because mar lago is in Florida, was also informed. So, but so fact of the matter is, there were so many departments and people and personnel involved, not because this was an extraordinary case, because this is how it normally works. And Trump is mad because, well, he did the one thing that no president has ever done took documents from the White House to his home. Now, for all those that all those that don't know, there are certain documents in the White House that literally and figuratively don't ever go home with you. They go to the National Library of Congress. Those documents are stored for historical references. That's what they're for. They're stored, they're stored, they're put up. And for the simple fact of the matter, guys, a president cannot take those things home. You guys remember a few. You guys remember a few months back, they were sitting there, you know, tell you know the National Library was missing some documents, and they were asking Trump, "Where are they?" And now it's like, when you get referred to the Department of Justice, that's some serious mess. When the Department of Justice gets re- you get referred to the Department of Justice, it's not asking nicely anymore. Now there's something in your possession that you shouldn't have, and you're violating the law. That's all it is. And again, which also what also is unnerving about the whole thing is how Trump's trying to Trump's trying to shape it. Oh, this is a political witch hunt. Oh, that and again, it's not just him. Lindsey Graham and his, all of his loyalists are coming. And this is why I stay and say that Trump in itself, to be a part of that bonfire, it's to be a part of a cult. That's why I call him a failure in chief. A failure in chief a cult leader who sees himself romanticizing the idea of dictatorship and those who rode his coattails, those who are using his voters to boost their own political standing are all coming out the woodwork. Lindsey Graham, Lorraine Bobbert, Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, and so many others. Why? Because with his cult come votes. They don't even, I can guarantee they don't have to like the guy, but they like the people behind him because if he says to vote for said person, they will vote for said person. You're already seeing it now in the current primaries. You've seen it in Wisconsin. You've seen it in Vermont. You've seen it in um, in various other states that, had, that, have, that have had their primaries by now. That unfortunately, for a lot of those, those who were on the Trump train, um, won their nominations. Very, uh, very few actually managed to keep their keep their um, seats, uh, but at the same time, 
those very same folks that voted to impeach Trump are no longer a part of their parties. Again, it just goes to show you why they do this. Some of them believe fully in Trump because right now, as you've seen in Mar-a-Lago, and you can probably see it on other various news stations, folks are camped out in Mar-a-Lago supporting a president that supporting a failure in chief. And I say failure in chief because he's no longer the president, even though he called himself still president on all his stationaries, on true social, it makes no sense. You're not the president, so therefore you cannot call yourself the president anymore. But the failure in chief is still using this platform to sit there and say, this is a witch hunt. They even broke into my safe. And then your dumbass son comes on and says, there's nothing in the safe they need to grab. Yeah. But again, like I said, it's not just Trump. It's not just his family. It's not those that are just trying to make sure they stay okay in his private circle. Let's go to our friends at Fox News and see what they think of this whole thing. And again, you can't make this up. In the history of the Republic, we, we've never arrived at this point where a succeeding administration has sought to criminally uh, investigate uh, a previous administration of a president who's probably going to run for president again. Look at Hillary Clinton, the 33,000 emails that she just deletes that are completely gone and nobody bats an eyelash about it. We're at a political and ideological war, and they've obviously weaponized the, the Justice Department. We've done nothing about the FBI, and for three years they've been acting like um, the state police rather than the FBI, and now the Biden state police. I mean, this is an outrageous uh, uh, act. It's a disgrace. So, yeah. So what's so funny about this, guys, is that, number one, right, why do they expect the Biden administration to be a part of this? It's the Justice Department. The Justice Department is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It is supposed to remain, it is to, not only is it supposed to remain not associated with any party, it is literally the Switzerland in our U.S. government that the Justice Department is supposed to go after anybody and everybody including former presidents. You shouldn't be surprised by this. But you expect the Biden administration to sit there and go, we didn't know crap about this. This ain't got nothing to do with us. We're too busy trying to put out too many fires. We're not worried about, you know, we're not worried about Carrot Top down in, down in Florida. And rightly, they should be. Because this is what Fox News and other conservatives do. That when Trump is attacked... 
they have to defend him. Even more so that Marjorie Taylor Greene, if you go on her Twitter, because it's still there, she's saying defund the FBI. Defund the FBI. You know what I find so interesting that so many conservatives are attacking law enforcement right now that back the blue and blue lives matter are freaking quiet. Keep in mind what I said. Back the blue and blue lives matter are freaking quiet. No statements have been made. No fraternal order of police has came out and defended the FBI. No law enforcement agencies have came out and defended um, the Department of Justice and their actions. Nobody has said anything, which goes to what I've always said, that back the blue, blue lives matter, and all lives matter are bullshit. Because this is this is the reason why you think for those type of hashtag slogans that they will come out and be like, hey, we're just doing our jobs. We're doing what we're doing what we swore to do, what the laws are, we have to go by laws and what we're enforcing. You haven't heard caca. So that's why I wanted to, I wanted to point that out so much when I was like, where's the blue lives matter and all and where's the blue lives matter and all lives matter, folks? Back to blue folks. Y'all are mighty quiet. You people with the Punisher logos and the blue line license plates and the blue line decals, where are you? Oh, that's right. You only come out when it's black people. Understand. I mean, racist hell. Understand. But the whole thing about it is that Trump is it's like Trump doesn't realize, and I've been saying this, when it comes to the Department of Justice, but simple fact of the matter is they have a job to do. Merrick Garland, in my mind, made it clear as day that they will pursue the laws against whoever, whether it be a president, that whether it be a current president, or whether it be someone who wants to run in a couple of years, it doesn't matter. And the fact of the matter that Lindsey Graham's talking about, well, this is so close to the election that it's just it's it's problematic. No, it's not. <clears throat> it's not because. This isn't the presidential election. <laughs> this isn't. As, I, as I've been saying that we're less than a month away, uh, less, we're, we're less than a month away now, this is the midterms. The presidential election doesn't happen for another two years. So how is it problematic? It's only problematic if the GOP decides to still keep Trump in their corner instead of doing the smart thing and separating yourself from him. It's only you only look guilty if you back the guilty, which speaking of guilty, however, because, again, I'm still waiting for Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity, the other three heads, of the Fox Hydra machine to say something. I hope we catch it. We hope we do. We hope we do a weekend review because I still think the thing's funny as hell. But that's not the only legal problems Trump is having. Keep in mind, he is set for a deposition that was supposed to happen. But before I play what happened at the deposition, I just want to go down memory lane for a second. Y'all do remember um, this particular clip by any chance? Her staffers taking, taking the, the Fifth, Fifth Amendment. Amendment. How about that? And her ringleaders getting immunity is. Now, she has people taking the Fifth Amendment. Four people plus the guy who illegally did the server. You know, he put it in the illegal server. So they have five people taking the Fifth Amendment, like you see on the mob, right? You see the mob takes the Fifth if you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Yeah. So you guys remember that, right? You do remember that. I just want to point that out. Oh. Sorry about that. So you guys do remember that, right? Remember when Trump sat there and said, and they were going off on Hillary, which again, it's funny that at of all the things that the uh, Trump and his people try to bring up, they keep bringing up Hillary. Hillary and her Hillary, her thirty three thousand emails. Hillary and the Clinton Foundation, Uranium One. Hillary and Benghazi. Let's never forget about Benghazi. Yeah, they're bringing out all stops. All of them been acquitted. Hillary Clinton sat in that. You guys, for all those who don't remember, Hillary Clinton sat in a deposition for seven plus hours with a con with a congressional committee, and they found a wrongdoing. Hillary Clinton at the time was probably the most um, well-positioned 
experienced person to become the world, become our first Madam President. And yet she went through everything with a smile on her face and nothing was convicted. But, you know, let's leave it to conservatives to hang on to that little card because they spent two years and over $7 million investigating this and nothing came of it. In my mind, I think they should foot the bill, not the American taxpayer. But anyway, going back to what I said, you guys remember when I said, you guys remember the clip I just played, right? The clip I just played of Donald Trump saying, you know, if you're innocent, why do you plead the fifth? Funny that you should mention that Donald Trump, considering the, considering the fact of your actions of what you did at your last deposition. Donald Trump pleaded the fifth during this morning's deposition with attorneys from the New York Attorney General's office. This all comes as his attorney confirms that the FBI removed about a dozen boxes from Mar-a-Lago on Monday. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now. Hey, Ryan, good to see you. So the New York AG's office, as we know, has been investigating the Trump Organization's business practices for some time now. This probe is civil. It is not criminal. Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka Trump, they both recently testified. Why did the former president decide to invoke his Fifth Amendment rights now? Well, you know, he recognized what, uh, what how this was going to look, you know, pretty hypocritical, given that he's made these statements in the past about why would you invoke your Fifth Amendment if you're innocent? Um, so I believe we have a quote here from uh, the president in his statement uh, in which he uh, talks about this idea and sort of highlights this hypocrisy. If we could pull it up on the screen, um, he talks about this idea that um, the he said, I once asked if you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Now I know the answer to that question. When your family, your company, and all the people in your orbit have become the targets of an unfounded, politically motivated witch hunt supported by lawyers, prosecutors, and the fake news media, you have no choice. So he sort of predicted sort of some of the uh, criticisms that he would face given his statements in the past about why would you uh, invoke the Fifth Amendment. And, you know, there's just a lot of hypocrisy going all around, both in terms of, uh, in terms of his invo invocation of the Fifth Amendment, as well as his criticism of the handling uh, of the FBI investigation. This was an individual, uh, Trump, who was very critical of a certain former candidate uh, right. about their handling of classified information. And obviously doesn't seem to th uh, think it's so much of an issue anymore when uh, he reportedly took so many of those boxes home uh, containing what was classified information reportedly. Uh, Ryan, let's unpack that figuratively and, and literally here. We are still unpacking the FBI search of Trump's Florida home. Two sources familiar with that matter tell NBC News that agents were at Mar-a-Lago for nine and a half hours on Monday. Now, we're also learning that Trump's legal team had been in contact with the DOJ about those missing records. So what's the latest on all of these puzzle pieces when you sort of put them together where we are this morning? Yeah, and I think what's interesting just that people should make sure to take note of is that we're getting so much of this from the Trump side. We're getting very, very little information uh, about this investigation from DOJ and the FBI. And I think that's because it's so important for DOJ and the FBI to play this by the book. You're already seeing all of these calls for uh, DOJ and the FBI to break their what the Republicans want is for them to break their uh, their uh, the rules that they have followed in these typical investigations and come out and make some sort of public pronouncement. And I mean, Frankly, that's sort of what led to this situation that we're in today, just with Donald Trump benefited from uh, from what the FBI uh, did during uh, the 2016 campaign when uh, former uh, former FBI director Comey came out and made those statements. So basically what DOJ wants to do here is stick within the four corners, so-called, of the indictment or the paperwork or the court paperwork that comes forward and only speak through the court process and not make uh, out-of-court uh, pronunciations about an ongoing uh, investigation, especially that would bring derogatory information potentially about a former president. Yes. Leave it to Trump to turn around today and say, oh, but if you're if you're innocent, why do you plead the fifth? Trump pleads the fifth. Now, of course, a lot of people can sit there and say, well, that's typical politics. But again, I'm not surprised by this. There's a lot of I've been saying this for going on two plus years in this podcast that I kept saying that Trump was going to go down. Didn't say how it was going to happen, but eventually it's going to happen. And whether it be through his shady business uh, business deals, his tax returns, his behavior as a president, and even now with documents that have been caught that he did not turn back over that are sitting in Mar-a-Lago, it does not look good for the failure in for the former failure in chief. This is the point I keep making that again every statement he's making it's almost like. He is directing it again. And we shouldn't be surprised because 
Now, as you guys heard a few stories back, the January 6th commission would like a word with him. It's just chickens coming home to roost. Now, I would be remiss to sit there and say that, you know, this could lead up to and this could lead up to next to nothing. It could or it couldn't. But at the same time, it's just fun. To, it's it's. I know this is kind of bad to say, but I'm going to be honest. It's kind of fun to watch. It's kind of fun to watch him and everything around him is starting to fall. And the people are still hanging on to a burning house like rats on a sinking ship. I will never understand it. I really, truly won't. Moving right along, guys, again, in my home state of Tennessee, where everything is progressively backwards. <sighs> I cannot believe that this is a thing. That in order to solve our homeless problem, when we should be building more shelters, using funds to give more resources instead of more sports arenas, to actually help people off the streets and actually help them into affordable housing, because Lord knows we have the space, the state, of the state legislature has done something that I didn't think was going to happen, but yet, at the same time, this is a red state. I should not be surprised. Tennessee just became the first state in the nation to brand this a felony. <laughs> Pitching a tent on public land that's not actually a campsite. We're out here homeless. We're trying to struggle to make it, and they're just trying to make it worse on all of us by criminalizing it. It's a huge deal because a felony offense carries up to six years in jail, a $3,000 yeah. fine, and the loss of voting rights. And makes finding a job or a home even harder. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The bill's sponsor declined our offer of an interview, but said this. This bill requires law enforcement give a documented warning for the first incident, and any punishment thereafter is up to the prosecutorial discretion of the district attorney. It's a felony to survive. Tanisha Green says police have already told her she must now obey that sign. They said that it'll be an action that we'll go to jail. And do you have anywhere, any place else to go? I don't. I've been here a year. Next door in Missouri, a similar law takes effect this month. A misdemeanor, not a felony. But local governments that don't enforce the camping ban can be punished. And money earmarked to build permanent housing must instead be used to fund treatment programs and build state-sanctioned temporary homeless camps. This is a push to put the most vulnerable people into internment camps. Similar bills are now being considered in Arizona and Georgia. We're sitting right on the tipping point right now. In Oklahoma and Wisconsin, similar bills were introduced but failed. And those similarities are no coincidence. They're all based on a model bill produced by the Cicero Institute, a think tank in Austin funded by a tech billionaire. Texas passed a version of Cicero's bill last year. We have no no influence except the power of persuasion. We're merely saying, here, here seems to be a better idea. We know what's not working. Something called housing first has become the primary approach to tackling homelessness. Get someone an actual home, not a shelter bed. Offer, but don't mandate addiction treatment. And the rest should follow. Many studies support the approach. Cicero does not. We don't have decades to wait to build up brand new houses for every one of those people. We need to have a solution that's acting right now. He's addressed lawmakers in Tennessee. Homeless encampments are bad for the homeless themselves. And in Georgia. We can't offer you alternatives, but you have to move. You need that, both the stick and the carrot, and this bill provides those. In a leafy Nashville suburb. I can see your issue. Yeah. You haven't seen anything yet. This is what Becky Lowe's local park now looks like. Nothing has been working. We're, nothing has worked. She now supports the stick approach, the threat of a felony conviction for just camping. Where do you think these people should go? Well, we have dozens of shelters throughout Nashville. I was in a, a temporary shelter and I didn't like it <laughs> uh, because uh, you're not treated as a human being. A sentiment shared by many. Howard Allen now has a permanent home. When I moved in my house and they put that key in my hand, I cried. And then I cried again because my brothers and sisters are the same thing that I have, housing. And we can do it. Maybe we can do it, but we seem to be increasingly disagreeing over 
how we can do it, how much carrot, how much stick. Even here in liberal leaning Los Angeles, just a couple of hours ago, after let's say a very lively public comment section, the LA City Council voted to ban camping within 500 feet of every daycare center and every school. Now, no matter how you look at this, I've always then said, I right, look, Tennessee is my home state. I hate Rocky Top. I hate that song every time it's played. But I've always sat there and said, you know, Tennessee is progressively backwards. But it's not just Tennessee. Other states are going for this. Now, understand, it's amazing to me whenever you speak to somebody about being homeless. It's like, well, well, they, well, they don't have to stay on the street. They have shelters. Have you seen shelters? The man is correct. If you've never volunteered a shelter, stayed at a shelter, look, they don't they, look. I know all shelters aren't the same, but the shelters that you know are kind of lowbrow, don't have a lot of space. Um, you have to be in at a certain curfew. Um, if you are if you are needing if you are on drugs or need assistance with you, times out nine times and they turn you away. Um, yeah, most people don't feel safe in a shelter anyway. I mean, the, the list goes on. But it is amazing to me that those who are not in the same plight, because they don't like the homeless park in their parks. They don't like the homeless um in areas that may be close to their homes because it's all it's all they they, they post up they camp on public land. Um most people sit there and say they don't like it. So what do you do? It's almost like panhandling. It's like you want to ban panhandling, but at the same time, there's still a lot of people out there, especially with the given housing market, that homelessness may increase. I've sat there and said it best. It is amazing to me that in Nashville, we have a lot of abandoned buildings, mostly hotel structures, that with the right funding can be made into apartments for homeless people, for the homeless. Those, I mean, for all those, of course, the mills that sees what I'm talking about. You know what, if you in Nashville, if you live in Nashville or been in Nashville uh, for at least a year or two, you'll know what I'm talking about, about these abandoned hotel motel structures that can be refurbished, that can be built properly to be apartment homes for the homeless. Like my thing is, for the simple fact of the matter, there's ways to fix this. This whole thing of, well, they just won't go. I was like, you have to, it's like, well, again, if you've never stayed in a shelter, then you kind of understand where they, if you've been in a shelter in that situation before, you understand where they're coming from. But I can also understand from your, from your homeowner that, you know, there's always that threat of homelessness bringing, you know, people that might go after kids, people that might, you know, be an eye. It's like the whole thing about the one thing they don't want to say is it's an eyesore. That's the one thing they don't want to say, because if they sit there and say that these homeless people are an eyesore to their neighborhoods, then they'd be seen for what they really are. What I'm saying is instead of legalizing it, especially in Tennessee, making it a felony, which, again, that is the worst enforcement ever to make homelessness or camping out on public public uh, public land a felony, which means that now officers are going to be forced to have to enforce that. And if so, it's felon, which means that as the as the journalist said, as the journalist said in the bit, that if you are arrested, there goes your ability to vote. There goes your hard for you to get a job because you're now because you're now a felon. You can't own firearms. It's it's like a whole bunch of rights get taken away. Simply put, because you're just trying to survive. There are multiple ways to actually help the homeless. And housing, giving them housing, especially housing that can help them out their feet. There's plenty of there's programs that we can be doing with this money. And I've always said this to Nashville. Nashville will blow money on a stadium first and then somehow get to people at the end of the list with the very little funding that's left over, but still wonder why you have a problem. I don't think that I don't think again marking it making it a felony is not going to decrease homelessness. They're just going to go. They're just going to going to be going to riskier places or just going farther out in the woods where nobody's going to pay attention to them. Again, this is not going to decrease it. It's just going to make it worse. But why am I surprised? It's Tennessee, progressively backwards. Speaking of things that are backwards, guys, I wanted to get this next story anyway because you guys remember that. Um, 
the story of Emmett Till that uh, it wasn't too long ago that a uh, a warrant that was literally and figuratively in the basement of a courthouse was yet to be served. And for the simple fact of the matter is that because it was sitting there to indict the woman that appeared that accused 14 year old Emmett Till at the time of making advances toward her, right? That was supposed to be served. Now, did not know this until about a couple of days ago that this was looking into to see about whether or not they were going to indict, uh, to indict the woman um, on the warrant, who you can see right there, Kellen Brian Doham, um, which unfortunately the grand jury has declined not to indict her, which again, this was almost nearly 70 years ago. And this is the woman that lied the woman that lied to law enforcement at the time that Emmett Till was the man that was doing that to her. And the grand jury returned a no bill to the charges of both kidnapping and manslaughter. So I know a lot of you people are going right now, it's like, so she just gets to walk away. Unfortunately, yes. Because again, the grand jury decided that they did not want to press charges. I call BS. Because Emmett Till was still one of the greatest tragedies um, in U.S. history. That not only will the people that did the, did those tragedies and, and, and unspeakable things to that young man will never see their day in court, the woman who literally started all this will now never see a day in court over this. That is beyond fracked up. At the same time, I cannot imagine a jury unanimously voting not to indict, which, again, just makes me wonder how far we've really come if those atrocities are never really looked at, never really found accountable to those that have caused it. Well, again, it's just it's it's hard to demand justice when you go down there and you find just us. Boom, right along, guys. I did want to cover this next story as well. That again, there has been something positive out of this week. Outside of the PACT Act being signed, which again took a lot of shaming on the Republicans' part because they did not, they as much as they love veterans, they rather love wars, they were actually able to get a few bills passed. One was one bill that I think will actually help America in a positive way because right now we are missing out on something that is needed in almost everything that we use. To Washington, Washington tonight, tonight and President Biden marking a bipartisan victory and a major move tonight for American manufacturing, signing the $280 billion Chips and Science Bill to increase semiconductor production here in the U.S. Those chips in everything from cell phones to cars to military weapons, what it could mean for jobs and for American companies. Our senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce tonight with one manufacturer ready to go. Tonight, a nearly $53 billion boost for American manufacturing of tiny but critical computer chips. Technology powering everything from cars and cell phones to weapons of war. Folks, we need to make these chips here in America to bring down everyday costs and create jobs. The chips are essential to almost all technology, but made largely overseas in Taiwan and China. And supply chain issues have been causing major shortages and severe price hikes here at home. At this factory in Buffalo, New York, the company Spark Charge relies on these chips to manufacture mobile chargers for electric cars. The CEO, Josh Aviv, at the White House for today's bill signing. There's chips that we used to purchase maybe a year or two ago that used to be worth $1.98. That same chip today can range anywhere from $215 all the way up to $400. He says having these chips made in America will be a game changer. This means now we can boost production, we can hire more people, and we can ship more product quicker. The president has been taking a big victory lap here at the White House, celebrating a string of wins on his top priorities. And today... And again, I love that. That is actually a good move. Um, semiconductor chips, as I said before, is used in everything. But that used to be an imported item to the U.S. I have always sat there and said, no, for the U.S. to be competitive, we have to actually present products that can be made here, that can be sold here, and therefore boost our economy here. Semiconductor chips can definitely do that. I have no issue with that. That's exactly what we should be investing in. I still think we should be investing in green energy. I still think we that we still should be looking at renewables and things of that nature. But I've got nothing against semiconductor production because, again, as a gamer and as a person who builds computers, 
I have I have felt the pain of trying to get video cards right now for PCs. It is a pain in the butt because everything is priced way high because semiconductor ships. Oh, and if you're looking at electric cars or just cars in general, we can finally get those cars that have been sitting um, on lots for a time that can't be used because they're missing the very same semiconductor chips in order to actually operate. Again, it's a win all around. It's a it, it's it's something that you cannot find a lot of fault in. Just because the simple fact of the matter that it's helpful on all fronts, especially the fact that not only just job creation, but boosting our economy and at the same time, lowering prices, which we all want right now during this inflation. So no issue with that. Moving right along, guys, it is amazing to me that if we just can't seem to get Florida out of our rear view because... With the thing of Roe versus Wade, guys, we are still running into states that are either trying to ban abortions or limit abortions to unreasonable weeks of pregnancy. Um, the attorney general for Florida has decided that he will not criminalize abortions in the state. Ron DeSantis decided that, um, no, you can be suspended. Again, you can't make this up. A government is a government of laws, not a government of men. And what that means is that we govern ourselves based on a constitutional system and based on the rule of law. But yet we've seen across this country over the last few years, individual prosecutors take it upon themselves to determine which laws they like and will enforce and which laws they don't like and then don't enforce. Here I ask my staff in my office, to look around the state of Florida and to make sure that that was not going to happen here, where you would have individual prosecutors nullify laws that were enacted by the people's representatives. Uh, the prosecutor, state attorney for this judicial circuit, uh, Andrew Warren, has put himself publicly above the law. Most recently, after the Dobbs decision was rendered by the U.S. Supreme Court, he signed a letter saying he would not enforce any laws relating to protecting the right to life in the state of Florida. And mind you, we have had prohibition on third trimester abortions for a long time. We've had prohibitions on partial birth abortions for a long time. And then most recently, the legislature enacted and I signed protections for unborn babies at three and a half months. When you flagrantly violate your oath of office, when you make yourself above the law, uh, you have violated your duty. Uh, you have neglected your duty and you are displaying a lack of competence uh, to be able to reform those duties. And so today we are suspending state attorney Andrew Warren effective immediately. So again, I didn't see the governor's press conference, the circus, whatever he put out there. When I know if you want to talk about the abortion ban, when I became state attorney, I put my hands on the Bible and I swore to uphold the U.S. and the Florida Constitution. And under the Florida Constitution, the 15-week abortion ban is unconstitutional. And it's not just me saying that. It is a court of law that has said that. The governor's bill has already been thrown out. Now, it's subject to other appeal. But while the governor is hoping that the Supreme Court ignores the law in Florida, I'm the one upholding the law. I'm the one protecting people's rights. I'm the only one at this moment who's actually making sure that we are following the law in Hillsborough County. The governor's order is just based on pure conjecture and lies about what he thinks I'm going to do with cases that haven't even come before me yet. I, I was shocked at the blatant violation of one of the most fundamental principles of our democracy, that the people, the voters, get to elect elected officials. I've been elected twice to serve as state attorney, and I've served as state attorney, and I've done it well. Crime is down. We're protecting people's rights. We have fought so hard for public safety and fairness and justice. If the governor thinks he can do a better job, then he should run for state attorney, not president. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised about this. Actually, I'm very surprised. Who knew in Florida that the attorney general was like, I'm not going to criminalize abortion. And Ron DeSantis is like, wah, wah, wah. You're suspended. I didn't think the governor. I didn't think the governor had the ability to suspend the attorney general. I could be wrong. I'm not really that familiar with Florida law, but I'm just like Ron DeSantis has been doing quite a lot that makes you wonder if it's within his wheelhouse to actually be able to do it, because he acts more like a 
he acts more like a regent or a king of Florida than the actual governor. Um, but no, the state, the 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 prof, the, uh, the AG is right that for the simple fact the the attorney, the state attorney for Florida, or you know that position, uh, he's um, I'm sorry, Andrew Warren, he's right. It's the thing that he's swore to upload Florida law and the Constitution. He's not there to serve Governor DeSantis. And Governor DeSantis really is riding the high because in Florida, he apparently has no equal. But at the same time, imagine that you can just suspend your state attorney just because he doesn't agree with your point of view. And again, that just goes back to tell you how dangerous it is. A lot of these conservatives, when put in power, will do some stuff that'll be questionable as hell. And I do mean questionable as hell. Just saying. But we will follow that story as it comes along. Now, the other side, like I said before, guys, um, not only with the semiconductor plan being passed, the uh, Democrats were able to actually get another bill passed, um, the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, it's not everything that we wanted, but this will explain why. Alexis Christophorus for more on this bill's potential impact. And Alexis, they're calling this the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a ton of spending, though, in this bill. So how is it going to bring down inflation? Well, I've been talking to a number of economists and market strategists, Diane, putting that question to them as well. And most of them say that this Inflation Reduction Act is misnamed. They say it is a bill that is a tax and spend deal that will ultimately have minimal impact on inflation. And one thing they all agree on, it will not have any sort of an immediate impact on Americans' wallets. You know, the midterm elections are just about three months away. This bill, if it is indeed made law, won't have any real impact on inflation for at least a year to 18 months or more. So this is definitely not a quick fix. Also want to note that the Congressional Budget Office and other economic organizations actually studied this bill, and they too say it will have a minimal impact, if any, on inflation in the long term. Now, this bill would be paid for by raising taxes on large corporations and the wealthy. So how could that affect the average American? Right. And that's a big part of uh, how they're going to be paying for this bill. In fact, the 15 percent corporate tax rate is supposed to pay for 40 percent of what is in this bill. And, uh, you know, there are mixed feelings about this. Most economists believe it is going to be a punishment, really, for the average corporate America uh, corporation here. Uh, this is going to affect companies that are worth more than a billion dollars in this country. They say that ultimately this is a tax on shareholders, and that could even affect stocks that are in Americans 401k plans. They say that a tax like this is going to hurt companies' ability to invest in their own companies and also could give them pause to either give wages, higher wages, or to actually uh, increase their payrolls. Now, the bill would expand the Affordable Care Act and allow Medicare to negotiate down some prescription drug costs. So how far will that go when it comes to reducing the financial burden on your average American family? Well, you know, this bill is saying that it's going to allow the government to negotiate uh, rates with Medicare for the first time ever. That should help in the long run. It should also bring down the deficit. So these, those are two major positives for Americans and for the country overall. But again, in the longer term, uh, most economists I spoke to believe that Americans will start to see some much needed relief in terms of uh, their health costs. But again, that won't happen until at least 2024 or 25. And this bill also aims to fight climate change. It's implementing tax credits for clean energy initiatives. So how does that process work? So tax credits sound really good, uh, but when you look at the numbers, it still doesn't move the needle much for, for Americans. I mean, this tax credit that they're offering for electric vehicles, of uh, I think it's $7,500, the average cost of an EV car in this country right now is $66,000. So it's still uh, not affordable for most Americans. Uh, the, the tax incentive is not going to do much to incentivize people to go out and buy these things. And also, I want to mention that Senator Joe Manchin, when you're talking about climate change, one of the reasons why a lot of people believe he got on board with this uh, is because uh, lawmakers said they would support a pipeline in his state of West Virginia and also some more infrastructure uh, type deals and pipelines uh, throughout the country. All right, Alexis Christopher. So yeah, that's not the only part of it. Now, again, I get what the Democrats are trying to do. I do. But this has always been this has always been 
the the Achilles heel of Joe Biden's um, agenda. I will guess I'll say because you got to remember, he started off with a progressive agenda. He wanted to increase the minimum wage. He wanted to um, he wanted to do some sort of student student loan uh, forgiveness, which I'll talk about very soon. Um, he wanted to really step up green, the, you know, really get the green deal going. He wanted to get so many things going. It was so progressive that it scared centrist and modern uh, moderate Democrats. Scared them. Most importantly, it scared Manchin and it scared Cinema. Now, Manchin, as I said before, is a walking conflict of interest. That's why he didn't approve one. He didn't approve one uh, Joe one Joe Biden to pick a person for going to the EPA because her stance on climate change. Keep in mind, Senator Joe Manchin is from West Virginia. It is a coal mining state. They still believe that coal. They still believe that coal is the number one industry in that state, even though coal itself is a dying industry. The simple fact of the matter is, Manchin is also on a board of board of directors for a coal mining company in said state. Any green new deals would impact coal as far as its emissions, would therefore reducing it, therefore would reduce Manchin's paycheck and um, account, a uh, bank account, if you will. He is a walking conflict of interest, a man that is literally sitting on a board, a board of directors for a coal mining company should not have any say in anything EPA or climate control related because that looks like you have a conflict of interest. Kristen Cinema is for corporations. When they asked her, but when they asked her about the inflate the Inflation Reduction Act that they're trying to pass, instead of her using her own brain, she went back to the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and asked them if this is a good idea. Let me stress this again. Kristen Cinema went back to the Arizona Chamber of Commerce with the Inflation Reduction Act plan that the Democrats wanted to pass and asked them. Is this a good idea? Keep in mind, this is the same woman that in that plan, there was a tax on private equity firms. She received a half a million dollar campaign donation from equity firms literally three months ago and is now saying that it's a bad idea for the, uh, she, the only way she can get on board with this, I should say, the only way that she got on board with the inflation, the, uh, in the, the inflation Reduction Act that just got passed. The only way she got on board is if they remove that from the bill. The same way with Manchin. They also remove certain climate change uh, things around uh, investments, things of that nature, to get him on board, along with incentives for his state. Do you see the problem here, folks? That in a slim, controlled Democratic state, that for the simple fact of the matter, two senators basically altered the progressive movement um, on Joe Biden's agenda. Now, granted, Biden was able to accomplish some things, but not a lot of things. But in this case, for them to simply pass, simply pass not only a semiconductor bill, but to get somewhat of an inflation bill, which does have some perks. It does. Number one, Medicare will finally be able to negotiate drug prices, something that Republicans have fought tooth and nail against. I cannot stress that enough. Republicans have fought tooth and nail about Medicare being able to negotiate drug prices with companies. Because, because I said this before, I'll say it again. Healthcare companies and drug companies set the prices. There is no argument. At the same time, the U.S. for a long time has been a closed off drug market to other countries. We've only been able to deal with U.S. With, the U.S. only been able to deal with Canada and Mexico. Everyone else, pretty much persona non grata. But there is, like I said before, there is some pluses. But the one thing that I do want to stress out very heavily, which would have been a great thing in this bill had it got put in, was the fact the insulin cap. That, again, I want to stress this very carefully, Republicans had it stripped. Yes, the price on insulin would have been capped at $35. Republicans wanted the bill, wanted that nego wanted that part literally removed from the bill and then blame the Senate rules on budget reconciliation for that. Yes, that was the weak sauce. Keep in mind, the simple fact of the matter is, that was the weak sauce. 
And I stress this very heavily from the party that says they care about businesses, small people, veterans, and children. They do not care that you have to pay buku bucks for your insulin, for your Humira, for, for your kidney dialysis, for all the life-saving medical treatment and medicines that a lot of Americans need. Republicans do not care how much you have to pay. Even if something as simple as passing a $35 cap on insulin, in which a lot of Americans need because they are because they are diabetic, they couldn't even say yes to that. Nearly all of them voted no. All, nearly all Republicans voted no on capping the price of insulin at $35 to be included in the Inflation Reduction Act. Almost in the say is, guys, keep in mind when you go to the polls in September. Keep in mind when you go to the polls in September, especially those who have to who have to decide between rent, utilities, insurance, and your medicine. Keep in mind who said no to you, but yet their paychecks, their insurance, and above all else, their jobs are secured. That's all I'm saying. Keep in mind who you vote for. The last story I got, guys, before I get out of here again, I am not surprised by this, but Biden needs to make a decision. The Biden administration is going to, again, extend the moratorium on federal student loans before it expires at the end of this month, August 31st. They're extending it again. I cannot keep stressing this. It has been said by many people. I'm merely repeating the course. If you have the ability to extend the moratorium and keep pushing back the goal lines on when student loan payments are expected to start, if you are consistently kicking that can down the road, you have the ability to forgive it. If you keep pushing it back, you have the ability to forgive it. I have sat there and said over 20 million Americans are affected by student loans. Student loans have kept people from buying cars, purchasing homes, increasing their credit profiles, starting a business. It has literally been the block. And despite how you feel about it, despite how you feel, oh, well, you shouldn't be able to take out those loans if you didn't even think you couldn't pay them. I don't care how you people feel about that. We've been down that road of what happens when not everybody has the same financial opportunities. Not everybody has the same lanes to college. Not everybody had the same means to go. Sometimes you did have to take a loan to actually increase your, to actually get there. The problem was that the lack of jobs that was out there post-college was something that nobody expected. That also being said, folks, we are literally still sitting at $1.7 trillion dollars which we have spent five times over in wars alone. If we can spend five times the amount of the student loan debt in wars in Afghanistan and other places, we can certainly forgive the student loan debt. We can forgive it because imagine what happens. You have just raised the credit and financial profiles of 20 million Americans. 20 million Americans who do not have to worry about loans that they will never get out from under but will become spenders, consumers, homeowners, car owners, business owners. The simple fact of the matter is, if that debt is forgiven, credit profiles be raised. And you know what, Biden? If you forgave student loan debt before the 2024 election, you're guaranteed to win the next election. I'm going to go ahead and call it. I will go ahead and call it. Aside from the fact of decriminalizing marijuana, if Joe Biden did one of two, one of those two things, or did both, just for bonus points, you have just guaranteed your presidency for 2024. But again, like I said, if you can keep constantly kicking the can down the road on when student loan debt payments are going to start, it can be forgiven. It can be done. And it's been ha- and it's been way past time for it to be done. But that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and move on to our feel-good segment because usually how the fact we got here, we usually cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom and sometimes make you lose faith in humanity. But, hey, it's hump day. Tomorrow's Friday, which is Thursday. So we do want to leave you out. So we do want to leave you guys out with some good vibrations, and hopefully this next story has done that because, again, 
I always love finding stories about teachers and the impact they have on students because I have a special place in my heart for educators. And this one is no different. And it is always cool to see them not only get their flowers, but get rewarded for their good deeds. Check it out. With a very special surprise for an A, goes above and beyond for her students and her family. This segment is sponsored by Verbo and GMA contributor Megan Wright outside one of their vacation homes in Miami right now with that teacher who has no idea about what is going to happen here. Megan, take it away. Hello, hello. I am here with Vicky Puentes. Now, Vicky, you think that we are here to celebrate several teachers all over Florida, but guess what? We are here just for you. You are live on Good Morning America. We have something special planned. If you'll come with me, come with me, Vicky. I need you to trust me, Vicky. Okay, I'm gonna open the door up for you here. Open the door. Watch your step, Vicky. Watch your step, watch your step, watch your step. Okay, so I know that you have been a teacher and a counselor for close to 20 years. You always put everyone ahead of yourself. We are so impressed by your story. Come this way, Vicky, and we are not the only ones. Come on out here. Yes. Look at all of these people that are here. Yes, yes. Let's take a walk over here. Vicky, let's come over here. And also, Vicky, wait, look at me, Vicky, look at me. I know you think that your family probably sleeps in, but they <laughs> did it. They are here as well. Your family is here. Yes. We even flew your son, Danny, from Orlando to be with you as well. Now, Vicky, we wanted the people that you love to be here to honor you. We know your incredible story, but we want the rest of America to know it as well. Take a look. I'm posting a newsletter every single week. Stuff about PSAT, everything that you need. The seven common apps. It's the middle of summer, but Miami Senior High Advisor Vicky Puentes is taking no days off. Good afternoon, Cap Office. This is Ms. Puentes speaking. For the last five years, she's been the school's college assistant program advisor. The symbols of her selfless dedication are pinned with pride on the Cap Office walls. The hours that I put in here are never wasted. Everything that I do is, is just to maximize somebody else's personal and human experience. Class of 2022 graduates Samantha Yera and Gabriel Ferrer say inspiration could be found in these halls. Coming here and seeing people like Ms. Puentes is the things that makes you want to wake up in the morning. These first-generation college students are navigating uncharted territory. I had no idea what I was doing when I was filling out my financial aid applications. It could have felt lonely, but it didn't because she was there. Whether it be Ivy League or HBCUs, Mrs. Puentes' mission is to inspire her students to dream without limit. I'm from the same neighborhood. I still live five minutes from here, and success is definitely at their reach. Their background doesn't necessarily dictate who they can become. This four block radius isn't their limit. It's a mantra she first had to believe herself 30 years ago as she walked these very halls as a student. When she was a student, she had a passion for education and now she's more passionate about it. It's a full circle moment. She's paying it forward alongside the very teachers who helped nurture the burning light inside her. This vocation that she has for education, for teaching or for helping kids we is know like no one else's. Where are my seniors? Ms. Puentes makes Miami High a home. She truly, truly is like a second mother to not only me, I'm sure, but it's April too. For sure. Read to what you put. No, you can. And her four children have nothing but pride and adoration for their mom. Yeah. That's our officer picture. Yeah, that's my main mom. Yeah, so <laughs> it's my number one. Her three sons are all graduates of Miami Senior High and her youngest daughter currently walks the same campus. My mom treats every student the same as us. She spends late nights, hours talking to these kids, kids that probably don't have a good situation at home, and she's there for them every hour of the day, willing to help them with whatever their needs. There's no other way to describe Ms. Puentes as somebody with more than a thousand sons and daughters. Vicky, how are you feeling? Oh, Rome, I'm super excited. Honored to be here. 
my favorite thing to do is to say, <laughs> we're not done yet. We are not done yet. Let's um, bring out Melanie Fish, a travel expert for our sponsor, Verbo. Melanie, what's going on? Mrs. Puentes, you are a shining example of bringing people together. And that's what Verbo is all about, bringing people together, which is why we're celebrating today at this beautiful vacation home. It's just an example of the places available on the app, across the country, across the world. This one would actually be great for your family. It's got five bedrooms. <laughs> There's plenty of room around the pool for your students. So we're happy to be celebrating here, but it's not quite enough. We also want to celebrate you by giving you $20,000 to go to <laughs> A dream vacation. You can choose a whole private vacation home anywhere in the country. We want you to take your whole family because really it's just as much about who you're traveling with as where you're going. Congratulations. Yes. Well, everyone, what do you think? Let's hear it from Mrs. Yes. Back to you guys. Thank you, Meg. And again, that's one of those things where I say you love to see it. I, like I said, educators, educators will always have a special place in my heart just because they have such a great impact um, on students as well as things you don't forget. Like I, There's still teachers in my mind I still can name that have shaped me into the person I am today. So again, I'm forever grateful. But that's going to do it for this podcast, guys. I do thank you guys. For, thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all for liking, watching, sharing, letting people know it's live. I certainly appreciate that. Before we get out of here, I do to do some shameless plugging. First, shout out to my buddy Vaughn at BigBZA. You can definitely find him, BigBZA. on all socials on Facebook at A.Stevon Westboon. Um, he definitely does have some podcasts as well as Beats. He is doing Beats. He is back to its roots. Um, very talented producer and beat maker. Definitely check him out for the BT makes. And even though if you find some that you might have purchased yourself, definitely reach out to him at big BZA dot on all socials. As for yours truly guys, as you can see, uh, as, as far as socials for me guys, uh, whether it's on TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, <laughs> um, everywhere, Twitter, <laughs> you can all, you can find me at black 447, like, and follow me on all socials. I like to actually post things that I've seen that I've watched that I reviewed. I also like to post gym stuff because I do a couple pushups at the same time, guys, I am all about motivating and pushing each other forward because we have had a rough couple of years. And honestly, my, my wish is that we could all be a little bit kinder, a little bit more decent to each other, a little bit more open. Like I said before, check on all your friends, family, loved ones, because not just making sure they're doing all right, they could be all be fighting battles that none of us may know about. And by checking on them, you might do a lot more than showing that you care. You actually may save a life in the process. So again, be kind. It takes zero energy to be nice. It takes everything to be a dick. So don't be a dick. Aside from that, guys, like I said before, if you're going to be out in heavy areas with a lot of traffic, please, please still wear a mask because, again, the coronavirus and its Decepticons and its variants and monkeypox. Who didn't have monkeypox on their bingo card for 2022 is out there. Please be careful. Please take care of yourselves and each other. And that's how we're going to beat this in this pandemic era. Um, last but not least, guys, the thing that you see at the bottom that's been tracking is also my link tree. I'll just make that a little bit bigger. If you copy and paste that into your browser, take to my link tree that has the YouTube and Facebook groups for all of my podcasts. How the fam got here? Get bitten of course off of this podcast. Please, please like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. Like, share. I don't have the visuals yet, but I'm getting there. Like, share, and subscribe because I do want these things to grow even bigger than what they are. Last thing I'll say about how the fact we got here, guys, it's all about staying informed. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. We are simply giving you all the information to allow you to make up your own mind, but we're providing a logical perspective that goes along with it. We do a lot better in society when we're informed. We're progressive. We move forward. We try to right the wrongs of our past by making decisions now that we should have done back then. Like electing our first black woman to the Supreme Court, electing our first black woman to the Federal Board of Governors, electing our first four star black general in the U.S. Army. Um, I'm sorry, the U.S. Marines. Apologies. Also electing our first woman to a high commanding post in the U.S. Navy. When we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. That's why we keep asking ourselves, guys, why does everything go by our paycheck? Why are we electing new politicians but still the same old game in Congress? And most importantly, how the fact we got here. Thank you all for watching, guys. Please take care of yourselves and each other. We will all get through this.